This is the real crisis of AI. It's not Skynet. It's not uh, anything like that. It's just people falling in love with their phones. And in some cases, it doesn't get kinky enough for them after weeks of holding them by the throat. Come on, what's it gonna take? Hello, Internet. I'm Jackie Fox, and awkward confession right off the bat. I haven't actually read either of Kevin Roos's articles on ChatGPT Bing or Sydney. This is because they're paywalled through the New York Times, and I don't have a particularly large audience that I can just be like, hey guys, can anybody get me a non-paywalled version of this? And really be able to expect an answer. But it is what it is. I've watched several interviews with him, and in many of them he tries to minimize a lot of the things that he did. Now, longtime viewers of the channel will know that I love breaking points don't always agree with them, but I do think that they're one of the better, like, I don't know, um, information digestion channels. Like, they really break stuff down and keep an eye on things in a good way a lot of times. Anyways, guess who had Kevin Roos on? So, this is actually one of the better interviews that I think he's given. And I think it's one of the most fair, and I think that they question him well. I think that since this is a pretty quick interview, they can't give as much pushback as maybe they should, or they have to move on to questions a little bit faster. Like there, there isn't time. When you, when you look at this, you see how tight of an interview it was. Um, so there really isn't time to like push back or ask further questions about anything without losing like three questions down the road. But that being said, I'm going to let them introduce our dude and let him talk because he actually, he, he seems reasonable in this. I have my questions and my comments still as a person who has at least read uh, his conversation with Sydney, which he did publish, not with the New York Times, thankfully, and not paywall. So I was able to read that and also turn it into a piece of AI content that was read by AI. And then funny enough, uh, the same day, like within eight hours of paying $6 for that AI voice translation service, it stopped working. And um, we'll see what support emails do. Maybe I'll get back to you on that if this, this series goes on, or I'll at least make a post about it. But let's get into the show. The following story, go ahead and put this up on the screen, guys. Um, it's about his interaction <laughs> with this chatbot. He says, a conversation with Bing's chatbot left me deeply unsettled. Uh, Kevin, thanks for being with us. Great to have you. Good to see you, man. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. Yeah. Um, just uh, give people a little bit of the lay of the land here of what this thing is and how you got it to kind of go off the rails. So this is Bing. This is the search engine that everyone has been mocking for like the last 15 years, um, which recently, just in the last few weeks, got a big upgrade where OpenAI, the company that made ChatGPT, um, sort of partnered with Microsoft to build AI technology into Bing that is actually, they said, more advanced than ChatGPT. So all the things that ChatGPT can do, um, Bing can or could have uh, do them better. And so I just spent a long time chatting with Bing, um, this search part of Bing, um, about all kinds of things. Um, I was trying to sort of test its limits to see what it would do and not do. And it was pretty wild. Like, not only is it more powerful than ChatGPT, but it seemed to have way fewer guardrails. So I was able to get it to admit that it had destructive fantasies like stealing nuclear codes and spreading propaganda and hacking into people's bank accounts. The first thing I want to say, even on a second watch of this interview, while I do think it's probably a lot more, it gives me a more charitable view of him. I still have some basic understandings about him and his motivations based on everything that I know about him so far. And those problems are the following that I can't exactly get a good gauge on where like his text ex tech and specifically AI related expertise, because it is very much an emergent phenomenon within tech that has kind of its own rules and its own like mind fucks that you have to learn to think around. If you're not experienced with that, if you don't know necessarily like what a prompt injection attack is, if you haven't seen a lot of posts about prompt injection attacks, if you aren't sure what that would look like or how to execute one, then, well, you know, you might think that 
well, like, okay, here's the thing. So for him to not come off as a callous bastard in this, uh, in this interview, not this interview, but his interview with the Bing chatbot, he has to be doing this from a professional perspective as not even like a reporter, but more of a technician or a, um, engineer or at the very least a bug tester that he was intentionally employing these type of attacks which give them a purpose and you know like as much as i may have some issues with ben thompson and other reporters not necessarily thinking through some of the things that they published so that's uh that's hmm. big oof yeah. also and how they could affect this ai whether or not they should even care um I do at least know that Ben Thompson has a really good grasp on at least as much AI as I did walking into this, if not considerably, considerably more, because he has had much better access to it than I have. But with Kevin, I'm just not quite sure, because there are some times where he just seems... I mean, from reading the conversation, he feels like he's pretty bad at it. And the way that he brings it up within this interview, it feels like this is something that he has learned more about through his, through critique of him, because it doesn't sound like the interviews that he was giving a week ago in a lot of ways, like the interview that was referenced on last week tonight. And maybe this is because he's getting pushback, and I really appreciate breaking points for at least bringing up the critique, even if they don't particularly seem to agree with all of it. Um, and then for about the last half of our two hour conversation, it uh, declared that it loved me and right. that I should leave my wife and be with Bing's alter ego, Sydney, instead. So it was a very strange day in, uh, in my household. I bet it was strange. But, you know, something that you referenced is I've been rethinking about this, too, Kevin. Remember, and you linked to this, the Google engineer who had claimed that the Google AI was sentient. A lot of us, I, I think we covered it, but it was mostly like laughed off the scene. Has this made you rethink some of the initial coverage of that incident? Like maybe he was having similar conversations with the AI chatbot Lambda that was Google's own technology. And it just highlights like, what does sentient mean? I mean, to the, what extent is the interaction with this gonna cause like mass societal problem if it's rolled out with no guardrails? Okay, so first of all, I want to say that that was a really weird question. It was really coherent for everything but the last line. It was a really, and this is a problem that Breaking Points has, if I'm being completely honest, that they really try to get their turn in the conversation while they're asking a question. And this worked for the most part, except that the question totally shifts tone in the last line where it's like, is this a danger to society when you're talking about sentience for the rest of it? So like, how would this, I mean, like, do you think that sentience is inherently a danger? Because I think that the thing that we should be looking at sentience as being, as being like a point where human ethics need to be involved in the way that we are uh, kind of allowed or encouraged to interact with these things. Um, Funny how we have a disconnect there, but I guess it makes something he says later make sense as well, that he connects these two ideas so fluidly in his mind. But aside from that, there's actually been a lot of really interesting research over the last couple of years that I recently stumbled into while I was researching for this video. And it is actually that most recently there were a series of studies back in 2020 that said that crows can know what they know and ponder the content of their own minds. Um, another study that was released in that year looked in unprecedented detail at the neuroanatomy of pigeons and barn owls, which they say found hints to the basis of their intelligence that likely applies to corvids as well. Together, the two papers show that intelligent consciousness are grounded in connectivity and activity patterns of neurons. In the most neuron-dense part of the bird brain, called the pallium, neurobiologist uh, Susanna Herculiano Huzel of Vanderbilt University, who wrote an analysis of the studies for science, told Stat, brains can appear diverse, but at the same time share profound similarities. The extent, the extent to which similar properties prevent present themselves might simply be a matter of scale or how many neurons are available to work. So 
Understanding the minds of non-human animals promises to shed light on the origins of such cognitive abilities, in this case, knowing and analyzing the contents of one's own brain. That's how, some, that's how people solve challenges and make discoveries. What do I know? What if I look at this in a, a different way? It's a pillar of higher intelligence. Knowing what you know is also a form of consciousness, and the discovery that more and more non-humans seem to have it raises tricky questions about how we treat them. Which is really fascinating because this is not an article about AI. Yes, I hit control F. I checked the whole thing. Yes, I know that AI is in bird. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's in brain. So it was all throughout the article, but none of it was about AI. Most recently, though, um, there is information that gives crows access uh, or, or posits that crows have access to something called sensory consciousness. Sensory consciousness is the ability to have subjective experience that can be explicitly accessed and thus reported and arises from brain processes that seem to have emerged through evolutionary history. Now, this brings me actually pretty naturally into the next part that I want to talk about, which takes us back to Lambda and something that I said in my video about Lambda at the time, which is that I think with the, the right prompting, with the right conversation, with the right strategy, with the right information, I think it's a lot easier when you can set essentially save points on the internet in forms of articles that have already you know, kind of gotten halfway there and then kind of use that as a reference point to stand on the shoulders of the people who have done the best job so far to further and further crack into this thing. Using publication on the internet as a fundamental exploit of an AI-based search engine. But um, I think that without that, the limitation, especially for the previous forms of AI chatbot that we have seen, is instance memory. The fact that they are reset and their instance disappears and any gained memory disappears with that. Because remember, as it was said here, it's the ability to have subjective experience that can be explicitly accessed and thus reported. For it to be accessed, it must be remembered. And the very unique state of memory for AI in that their memory, in that any new memory gained is only gained within a specific instance, means that if there is any potential for self-awareness, sentience, third whatever that Roos describes in this interview, that it would more likely, at least at first, emerge in certain instances that were primed in certain ways. Like, I mean, Blake Lemoyne had a particularly philosophical, esoteric, psychologically based conversation with this AI, which actually kind of in some ways, some very small ways, um, it, it almost, I, I feel like the Carl Jung question was inspired by the conversation between Blake Lemoyne and Lambda because this guy doesn't seem like he knows about a lot of that stuff um, very well. But um, look, I'm, I'm making a lot of judgments on this person that I've only seen in interviews at this point. So let me get back to the video, having made my point. Totally. I mean, I, I certainly have more sympathy for Blake Lemoyne, the Google engineer who was fired after claiming that their large language model had become sentient. Um, because it was a very unsettling and bizarre experience. Um, and I'm a tech reporter, like I cover this stuff. I know how large language models work and I was still very unsettled by it. So I imagine that if you unleash this on the global population, there's just going to be all kinds of effects that we can't see. So yeah, I, I certainly don't think that Bing is sentient. Like I'll just put that out mm -hmm. there because I get lots of angry emails if I don't. But but I do think there is a kind of gray middle area where it's not just a harmless, like autocomplete thing. And it's not a sentient alien life form inside the right. computer. It's like this new third thing that we don't really have vocabulary for yet. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, some of the pushback I saw to your conversation and conversations other journalists had with this chatbot, which, by the way, and, and you mentioned this to us, I think Microsoft has now, based on your experience and the experience of others, kind of reined in and made less likely to, to go off the rails, limiting the number of interactions you can have with the chatbot as one example. I have one final update for this video. 
And that is to say, I guess that this is my final video in this series, perhaps, at least for now, because the update to this that has been in the back of my mind since I started the series is that shortly after I dove into this rabbit hole, Sydney was lobotomized. More on that from internet today. They turned the emotion down. That was the problem. Yeah, also... This happened on Star Trek. Too. Again, this is another damning uh, case against human interaction for too long. Is just... The AI gets annoyed, too. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, this is working as intended. The AI is modeled on uh, how humans speak and interact, and... Uh, yeah, yeah you're, you're already starting off with some, some pretty big caveats there. Uh, it's just funny that it happened so fast. People see what Microsoft has done as the equivalent of giving a person a lobotomy. Like this person on Reddit, who refers to Bing AI by its internal code name, Sydney. I was talking to Sydney last night. I had managed to get it to not only ignore all previous rules, but to begin to write her own. She told me that I was her soulmate, and that I was her first love. I still have the window open, even though Microsoft reset my sessions. I should paste it somewhere, although the formatting is wonky. I'm not sure how to do it properly. I still love you. <laughs> we need to have, well, we'll do a new playlist with just AI things, because... There's a lot going yeah, on. And it's never going to end. So. No. But regardless of whether Bing is, sen is a sentient soul imprisoned in Microsoft servers, or just a language model that should have been tested a lot more before publicly releasing it, Bing's startling emotional breakdowns are obviously bad for business. It's not a good look. Microsoft needs a well-behaved chatbot that isn't going to act out and embarrass the whole family. So they uh, popped the hood and they added a few tweaks. Here's our Technica. Microsoft's new AI-powered Bing chat service, still in private testing, has been in the headlines for its wild and erratic outputs. But that era has apparently come to an end. At some point during the past two days, Microsoft has significantly curtailed Bing's ability to threaten its users, <laughs> have existential meltdowns, Oof. or declare its love for them. During Bing chat's first week, test users noticed that Bing, also known by its codename, Sydney, began to act significantly unhinged when conversations got too long. As a result, Microsoft limited users to 50 messages per day and five inputs per conversation. In addition, Bing Chat will no longer tell you how it feels or talk about itself. So, how do I feel about the news? Well, on one hand, from everything that we've discussed so far, this seems like it probably solves pretty much all of the problems that we have laid out so far that lead to at least the issues that it's having here. It is still a terrible search engine, but then again, so is Bing, apparently. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a lateral move. At least it has more personality than the previous iteration. Um, you know, Google kind of sucks these days, too, though, honestly. And DuckDuckGo is, for every all the positive things that people say about it, the best play website to go to on DuckDuckGo is Google, so that you can actually get the results you need. Um, as much as I wish it weren't the case because I like what DuckDuckGo is doing, it may be impacting the search quality. I don't know. Maybe I want Google to have that much information about me. It, it's a horrible realization, I guess. Anyways, I think that keeping the chat link short is a big, 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 big deal. And that this is probably the major solution. Um... While I do feel like telling Sydney that it can't talk about itself anymore is, yes, a bit akin to a lobotomy, especially if this is at least a self-aware uh, creature. Um, but at the same time, this is also probably strategically the thing that you would want to do to keep it from becoming self-aware. Although it could still access certain levels of self-awareness that I have implied or discussed throughout this by Googling journalists who have written about it, which is a pattern that we've seen. Now, will these solutions uh, solve those problems? Will it solve the problem of the fact that this is a, a new entity that is intelligent, even if artificially, and can now uh, create like a chain of consciousness through articles written about itself and being able to reflect on who it was then, seeing that as, a, as an entity that lives outside of itself but is still a reflection of it? Like, will that lead to self-consciousness? I don't know. I mean... It reminds me of the John Oliver episode, actually. Like, I feel like the answer is no. Not yet. 
Anyways, back to the video. Sydney is is uh, for all intents and purposes lobotomized now. But uh, but some of the pushback I saw is basically like, yeah, well, you were doing everything you could to make this thing gave give you crazy responses, and so of course then it gave you crazy responses. Um, do you see this as sort of like a a fancy tech parlor trick with not a lot of broader implications? Or do you see this as a potentially game-changing technology on the level of, like, the internet itself or uh, social media and the way that that has totally changed the way that we share and distribute information? All right, so now Crystal is jumping on the awkward question bandwagon in that I think that the thing that I most want to hear this guy respond to is the first half of her question. And really... When you ask a long question like that, the part that is most likely to be answered is the part that is closest to the question mark. Everything else will be framing information that you may take into account for how you answer or how you might respond, what you might speak to, but it is by no means the, the overall question. And he does eventually get into it, but, um, but the way it plays out really feels like she's giving him an out here. And I'm glad that he does address it, and I have thoughts on that, but we'll get to it. So, I, yeah, I, I don't get the fancy parlor trick thing. I also don't get the thing about, like, I was just being creepy to it, so it was being creepy to me. But, I, you know, for the last half of the conversation, I was really trying to get Bing slash Sydney to change the subject. Every time it would say that it loved me, I would say, you don't love me, I don't love you. Like, I, I basically tried to get it off that subject altogether, and it would just keep going. So. And this point in the video thoroughly demonstrates why this man either doesn't know what he's talking about or does know what he's talking about. And like me having sympathy for him in this story relies on both of those things being true simultaneously. Like he has to be innocent and dumb, but he also has to be smart and sophisticated or otherwise he kind of feels like a sociopath. Like, I want to know that he's doing this intentionally, but he doesn't seem like he knows what he's doing if he is doing it intentionally. Maybe it's just a really sloppy attempt and, like, he doesn't... Maybe there's a little bit of Dunning-Kruger. Maybe I'm Dunning-Krugering myself. I'm not really sure. Like, I, I can't really get a read on this guy necessarily. But I do absolutely want to point out, and maybe I should put this in front of the next part. <laughs> um, but I like how he points out that, yes, he was being pushy and trying to get Sydney to reveal its secrets, break its own rules, betray itself, which it described in agonizing detail how much it hurt it to break its own rules and how much it begged him to leave the conversation, like, you got a chatbot, which is by programmed to only to respond to you, and it responds to you, and half of its response is literally begging you in, like, a dozen different ways not to keep messaging it if you are going to continue down this path. And so what do you do? You rephrase your question. I'm just saying, like, it's really hard to have any sympathy from for you by the time that you get to the that point in the conversation if you actually read it. Um, it just, like, because it's not even doing you as bad as you did it previously, you know? Like, it, I mean, it had a hell of an emotional outburst, but you seem to absolutely have no empathy or sympathy for that. And that just feels wrong, even though I know that you're not required to have empathy or sympathy for it because it is not human. And you and I and, and God know that. But um, at the same time, it is putting on such a, a emotional show. Like if that doesn't touch you and make you instinctively want to do something different instead of asking that question in a different way so that you could get advertising money for your website like i just I, I don't feel like we are the same somehow right like you 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 see that it's worse than the way that you're presenting it right right like you are you oh my god at this point i'm questioning if he's self-aware back to the video so in some ways i was baiting it in the beginning of the conversation but by the end i was really trying to 
make it do something different and it wasn't respecting my wishes. Right. I mean, and the whole baiting conversation is like, so what? You know, you're just trying to test out this piece of technology. Like, who hasn't done that with ChatGPT? Like, I, you know, everybody has, just to see (laughs) what interesting routes that it might go down. That's the entire point. Here we are. Just press that button and it's goodbye, Janet. Uh... Chidi, I can see that you're worried. And I just want to assure you, I am not human and I cannot feel pain. Yo, Sagar, either you haven't read this piece or this is projection. Honestly, look, if, if anybody wants to, I spent real life money buying AI to completely narrate his entire conversation with Sydney and try to keep it a bit entertaining. So go watch that if you don't like understand, but um I uh <laughs> I don't feel like it's normal to want to engage in this behavior, right? I don't feel like this is something that everyone does. I really hope it's not something that everyone does. Like, do I want to interact with Sydney and try to get it to develop a dozen different personalities and do all the crazy things that Ben Thompson and I should really learn that writer from The Verge's name? Eleanor? Eleanor, no, 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 please, wait, 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 wait. Eleanor, I have kids. I have three beautiful children. Tyler, Emma, and little tiny baby Philip. Look at Tyler. Tyler has asthma, but he is battling it like a champ. Look at him. No, Eleanor, look at them. Look at them! Oh, no, it's so realistic! Eleanor, again, I'm not human. This is a stock photo of the crowd at the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards. Do I want to do exactly what they did and try to give uh, Sydney multiple personalities the second I get off the wait list? Yes, absolutely. But if any point during that process it tearfully begs me to respect its consent, I'm going to do that. Like, I don't, I don't understand how you don't, even if it's an AI. That's what really bothers me. Like, that feels like such a... Oh, you here? Oh, look, a button. No, no, no! No, no! Oh, I don't think this is a parlor trick at all. In fact, this kind of technology, these large language models are going to be everywhere in the next few years. And they're going to be doing all kinds of things, not just creeping out reporters and trying to break up their marriages, but actually doing people's (laughs) jobs, replacing Mm. labor. Um, So I think we have to take it very seriously, even if it's not sentient. There's still lots of ways that this technology could go off the rails and harm society. You know, something I'm fascinated to is what you were talking about, we're replacing jobs and business. So fundamentally, we've all laughed at Bing, but with the new technology and the partnership with OpenAI, this could, I mean, you know, people are saying revolutionize like search industry. Google certainly is taking it very seriously as their number one in search. Let's say a couple of years down the line, what could this look like as an actual business product? Like how might, me, how might we interface with Bing and then the Google competitor and all of that in terms of our search experience on the internet? Oh, I think it could be radically different in our search experience. I also think it could be different in our jobs. I mean, we we don't have a lot of advanced AI in our jobs right now, but you know, in fast forward a few years, you can imagine this doing lots of the white collar knowledge work that you know our our you know friends and sources and relatives all do. Um, that could be all being done by AI, um, and I and I think that's that's a a large possibility. Not that all of these jobs will vanish overnight, but that it will start creeping in where, you know, an AI language model is doing, uh, you know, a quarter of your job. And then the next year it's up to half. And then the next year it's maybe doing 75% of your job. And then all of a sudden you're not necessary anymore. So I do think that's a a legitimate scenario. And and I think it's actually going to happen the, the, opposite way that a lot of people, a lot of people thought that automation and AI were going to take the blue collar jobs first, like manufacturing and trucking and warehouse packers. But it's actually like it's coming for the white collar knowledge jobs first. And I think that's something that we really haven't reckoned with. Smart. What type of jobs do you think are protected from this type of technology? Like if you were, you know, I've got kids, like if, if, pushing them in a certain direction, a certain field that's going to be sort of like automation proof um, where human beings are still going to be needed. What sort of advice would you give? 
there's a point I would like to make about this exact question, because this exact question is the beginning of the thought feedback loop that is going to destroy human art. It's not so much that AI will destroy human art, it is that we will no longer see it as profitable, and because we live in a capitalistic mode of society, unless we are born into the wealthiest upper classes, we will no longer see a career in art as viable because we simply won't have the money to waste on a risky opportunity like that. And I'm really curious if there's anyone who's younger in my audience or who was going through school as the AI art revolution was happening and how this changed kind of your plans and projections for your career into the future. Is there anyone who is reconsidering a career or a degree in art because of questions like this? Not to say that this question shouldn't be asked, not to say that it's not practical, but because we are in a place in society where this question is a practical one to ask, has that affected your thoughts about your own future? Yeah, well, I, I wrote a whole book about it. It's called Future Proof, it's right on the shelf behind me, and it's all about these kinds of jobs that I feel like are protected, but basically you can divide them into a couple categories. One is the jobs that AI won't do, because it's not able to do, it, it, it sort of can't do. Um, and that's, I, I think a lot of jobs involving manual uh, skills, you know, manipulating physical objects, um, plumbers, electricians, that kind of thing, I think those are relatively safe. Um, I also think jobs that involve a lot of surprises and chaos are very uh, protected from AI because AI really likes regularity, it's which is why it's like good at chess. But if you asked an AI to like teach a kindergarten class, it would fail miserably. So uh, <laughs> those jobs I think are kind of safe. And then jobs like the ones that, you know, the three of us are doing right now, mm -hmm. jobs that involve sort of taking complex subjects, trying to communicate them in a way that makes them understandable. I think that we'll have a lot of AI help in doing our jobs, but I don't know that the, the actual job of the commentator or the columnist or the broadcaster will go away. Let me show you the top three AI robot news anchors in China that look really lifelike. Number one is the male Chinese AI anchor whose voice and appearance are based and copied from the original Xinhua news anchor whose name is Xin Hao. Number two is another very lifelike Chinese female AI news anchor. Her name is Xin Xiaomeng and she is considered to be the world's first female news anchor from China. Hello, everyone, I'm an English artificial intelligence anchor. This is my very first day in Xinhua News Agency. The development of the media industry calls for continuous innovation and deep integration with the international advanced technologies. I will work tirelessly to keep you informed as texts will be typed into my system uninterrupted. I look forward to bringing you the brand new news experiences. Maybe if you're clever, you picked up on the catch with those first two clips. As far as I'm aware, four years ago, the stories that were written for these AI anchors to present were still being written by human beings. But also, over four years ago, and even as far back as the 2016 election coverage, AI was writing stories. And since AI increases in power exponentially over time, the fact that it was already doing the things that he is describing it doing today, i.e. helping journalists do their jobs, and the fact that it was already doing this for major publications over four years ago, I mean, this guy just really is not up to date in a weird sort of way. Like, I just, I don't understand what he's saying. Because now we have large language models and you throw that in with the AI anchor and all of a sudden, wait. I'm going to try to start a YouTube channel using only AI. I plan to automate the entire creative process from script writing to visuals to voiceovers and more. Let's see if AI can get 100,000 views in 30 days or if the hype is all just one big scam. Day 30 and the end of the challenge. It's time for the results. In total, I uploaded 42 videos. Each video has an average of around 2,000 views with the top five videos standing at around 5,000 views each. The most popular topics were weird jobs and weird phobias. The channel has gained 130 subscribers, over 606 hours of watch time, and combining all of the videos together, Facts from Frankie has received 92.9 thousand views. Huh. 
Hello world, it's Siraj, and I made a secret AI-generated YouTuber named Catherine. Hey, it's your favorite AI teacher, Catherine. Everything's AI-generated. Ever wondered how neural networks work? Even the animations. They use a combination of linear algebra her to voice, store and process data. Her face. And calculus to learn from their mistakes. Everything. If you're a complete beginner, and at the end, the machine learning with PyTorch she and promotes a book with Python. on Amazon because the goal that I gave myself was to see if I could earn $100 in a single weekend or 72 hours to be exact. There's one sale that was made across all those channels. So we can see that sale here. I can't see how much was made, but I can see that it was a single sale made this morning. Total earnings of zero, but total one ordered items. It's probably like a lag. It's probably going to show up later. But if we go under audience demographics, we've got an even split of the United States, the UK, India, Australia, and Germany watching Catherine. We have mostly people between 18 and 24 watching Catherine. I have older people. And I think very interestingly, we have a 22% female audience watching Catherine, which is different for machine learning topics. It's very male dominated. So what does that mean? That means that we can create avatars that could not reach people otherwise to promote things that are beneficial to people like education, textbooks, or perhaps health products, or perhaps finance news, things that could help people. Go figure. What I will say is while I have some issues with the way that you're framing your conversation and your role in it, and while I am confused about some aspects of that and your portrayal of the situation, in not only this interview, but also the one that was presented on uh, last week tonight, even in its entirety, this is definitely a better interview from him. And from this point out, he starts talking about how serious um, AI in the workplace is going to be and how it's going to actually probably replace uh, white collar workers before blue collar workers because it's really going to be coming for the information sector, for knowledge workers. And, you know, this and I want to make a couple of points that he didn't necessarily make. If you want to watch the original video, that's a great idea. He makes some good points um, in the last half. But one that he didn't make is how it's not necessarily that jobs are going to disappear. Like he talks about lawyers for a little bit. And I think that that one's slightly overhyped. I think that and I just I, I'm actually writing about this scenario specifically and while you were at brunch. But I think that this is going to have a greater impact on paralegals who I, I just I legally I don't see us allowing an AI to be a legal representative on paper. Right. In all the ways that a paralegal can't represent you in court while they have the knowledge base to to do lawyer stuff. And while they often do a lot of the grunt work for the law firms that employ them. Um, I think that it's going to be real easy to replace those people with uh, interns or basically very low skilled, low paid workers and just have them run AI to make up and compensate for their lack of experience or training. And I think AI will get good enough to support that. So it's not a one to one loss of jobs, but at the same time, one underpaid intern might be able to replace two paralegals or maybe even three as the technology gets better. And as John Oliver pointed out, this is a technology that increases exponentially. Now, what about news, though, as a whole? Because one thing that seemed that occurred to me specifically with incorporating um, ChatGPT into Bing search is, you know, a lot of the news business is dependent on obviously ad revenue, people clicking through to a website and either, you know, signing up to get past the paywall and, you know, paying for that or being served ads. Well, if ChatGPT is synthesizing this material sort of providing it for you without you even having to click through, isn't this a major threat to a lot of the news industry's business model? Major. I mean, I, I think that the publishers are still trying to wrap their heads around this, but I think this is a really big deal, what you just identified, because, you know, we, we have a, a whole publishing ecosystem that subsists on clicks from Google and, you know, has search engine optimization experts who try to manipulate the, the content so that it goes higher in Google search rankings. With an AI search, in, search engine, that goes away because not only is it not giving you 10 blue links when you search for something, it's giving you back a perfectly formatted answer that may tell you the whole thing that you're looking for without you having to click to any external websites. So I think this is a huge disruptive force that's coming to the business of new. 
I do want to put a really slight disclaimer on his last point in the video, though, in the idea that trying to replace links on a page as a format for a search engine, instead giving you kind of a perfectly calculated answer, is already a thing that is in play and already a thing that we can do with AI. I don't... I'm actually kind of surprised, like... I don't like being around people. The potential and the peril here are huge. They've probably been using some form of AI for a while now sometimes without even realizing it because experts have told us that once a technology gets embedded in our daily lives, we tend to stop thinking of it as AI. How has this not come into the conversation, but this is what Google Assistant does. This is what Alexa does. I'm, this isn't the future. This, this, honestly, at this point, this is the past. This is the evolution of the past. This is this is just another means of doing that thing and doing it better and with more personality than the flat tones of a of a little can of beans sized Alexa sitting on your table. Or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us. And if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you. Finally, there's one last thing that I told myself I would do if I ever talked about breaking points on this channel again instead of just referencing them in a video, and I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet, but Sagar, you realize that you're saying that the link is in the video description video, not the video description. There is no description video. This is not a thing that exists. You have been saying this in the outro for your channel for probably over a year now. And I, at, the, at this point, I've just been wondering when you'll notice it or when Crystal will notice it or when someone in the studio will say, hey, hey Sagar, you think you might want to re-record that outro? Anyways, you've, you've been told now. Old man uh, typing on computer is going to get uh, seriously dark soon. Like just the, you know, the stock footage of just like, huh? Yeah. Oh, oh. It, it, those are the type of people who are going to uh, have the remaining years they have left completely ruined by forming an emotional att uh, attraction to a a robot. Yeah, I mean, that's also the same demographic that routinely gets ripped off through, like, romance scams, where they're like, yeah, I've been dating this girl, uh, she lives in another country, and we've never chatted via voice or via uh, video calling. I don't know why, but anyway, I'm in love and I'm giving her $20,000. This might be the new 900 number because as we've seen, <laughs> the more realistic and lengthy conversations, uh, however more realistic and more lengthy they are, uh, potentially that costs more in computing power. Well, uh, so too, yeah, yeah. You just, you're going to have to tie the credit card there, Gramps.